Hello everyone, and welcome to the Year of Jacob of Sarug, an online series of lectures on the writings and theology of the Bishop of Batnan to celebrate the 1500th anniversary of his death. I am Armando El Khouri. I greet you from Washington, DC. Robert Kitchen, the organizer, the co-organizer, and I are glad that you are able to join us on Zoom today to celebrate Jacob. We welcome our viewers on the YouTube channel of the Maronite Eparchy of Los Angeles and on the Facebook page of Urho the Way. This talk is being recorded and will be posted online on the thehiddenpearl.org. We thank our guest speaker, Erin Galgay Walsh, for her paper entitled Well-Versed in Pain, Biblical Narratives of Healing in Jacob of Sarug's Poetry. Maria Dörfler for presenting our guest speaker, and His Excellency Elias Zaiden for sponsoring this online conference. Before we start, I would like to share with you the logistics of managing this talk. You may direct your questions to today's speaker only at the end of her talk. To do so, click on the reactions icon under the video feed. When this small pop-up window opens up, click on raise hand. I will call on you in the order I see you on my screen. And I will request that you unmute yourself. Once unmuted, you may ask your question. Recently, Françoise Bricel Chatonnet was elected to l'Académie des Inscriptions a Belle Lettre. We congratulate her for receiving this honor. We thought it would be appropriate to recognize her achievement today. So we asked Muriel Dubier to say a few words about our colleague, Francoise. Thank you, Muriel, for joining us. The mic is yours. Thank you very much, um, Armando and, and Robert, for uh, allowing me to say a few words uh, as a tribute to uh, Francoise Bricel Chatonnet's um, uh, achievements. Uh, as you said, she was elected at the uh, Académie des Inscriptions des Belles Lettres, which is one of the five French academies, part of the Institut de France. Um, and Françoise, uh, um, of course, richly deserved that, um, that honor. Uh, she started her career as an ancient historian and specialized in uh, Semitic studies which wasn't obvious uh, because most ancient historians um, would um, uh, work on Latin and, and, and Greek history, for instance, uh, in, in traditional French uh, curricula. So um, her choice was um, uh, uh, somehow different from uh, the, main, um, uh, the main choices of uh, historians at, um, at, at the time. By chance, um, during her PhD, uh, she worked on Syriac manuscripts at the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and that's how she started to learn Syriac and be interested in manuscripts. And that had a very important impact on the way she addressed uh, Syriac um, uh, literature and Syriac uh, studies uh, um, more broadly, because she got interested in uh, material culture. She um, worked on inscriptions and uh, archaeology as much as um, manuscripts, not only for the content, but for, on manuscripts as objects and what they can say to uh, historians, modern historians, about social history, um, cultural history, um, and, and of course, mater material history. And so Francis has um, widely uh, published uh, on these, um, these topics. I will uh, remind a few of her publications, for instance, uh, the inscriptions of her, uh, Kerala on which uh, she's, uh, she has worked. She has um, directed a book on churches uh, in the Syriac world, churches as buildings, not as institutions. Um, and those books are representative of uh, part of the work she did uh, and the field work. She, she did also in uh, India, in Syria, and in uh, Lebanon. And she is still working on uh, Syriac manuscripts in Lebanon and in Iraq. 
so that's the, the way she approached um, CREC studies and, and uh, contributed in a um, slightly different way uh, to, to, to the field. I mentioned that she did a lot of um, uh, field work and uh, that's another part of her contribution is the links she um, actually uh, tied with local communities and, 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 and scholars in, in the countries I mentioned, Lebanon, Syria, and well, Syria and, and, until the war, and, and, and India. I think that she didn't miss uh, one conference in, in Syria uh, since, uh, since the, the, the beginning. The other part of her contribution is uh, that she, she's been a, um, a leading uh, founding member of the Société d'études Syriaca and, and, and the two series uh, that were uh, created uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, the existence of, um, of a society. And Françoise is also now um, the editor-in-chief of an important uh, journal uh, called uh, Syria. And here you can see uh, the two main fields uh, of her activity, which is Semitic studies more broadly, and especially work on um, the Phoenicians and Semitic uh, epigraphy and Syriac studies. Francis has also been a mentor for many young uh, scholars and especially a role model for young uh, female academics and uh, her recognition as a femme scientifique de l'année, scientific uh, woman of the year, a, a few years ago, I don't remember the, the, the exact date, um, actually speaks uh, for that. And she managed to be recognized as such, although uh, she is, of course, scientific, but in uh, human sciences and not uh, um, sciences as such. So it was interesting to see that um, her specialty in um, Syriac and, and Semitic studies was um, re recognized the, this way. Uh, Francoise also uh, uh, played um, an important role in uh, writing uh, books uh, um, for broader audiences. I will show you um, three of them. One on the Arameans. Another one on the Phoenicians, and the third one on uh, um, the Syriac, um, the Syriac world. Uh, not only did she write books, but she also uh, was a part of many uh, radio broadcasts and, and, and TV broadcasts in, in France, um, bringing Semitic studies and Syriac studies to, to, to broader audiences. So that's another part of her activity, which was recognized uh, by uh, her election at the Academy. I will end uh, in uh, highlighting two uh, main uh, um, significant aspects of uh, this recognition. One is that uh, Françoise is one of a handful of women, a part of the French Academy, and that is also uh, something important. It's changing very, very slowly. She herself was uh, very often downplayed in uh, uh, traditional uh, milieus. Uh, she was Francoise, whereas her male colleagues would be professor, such or such. And so um, the fact that uh, she was elected as a woman uh, at the academy is also uh, um, an important sign for, um, uh, for the field. And uh, of course, she was elected not as a woman, but because her work really deserved it. And the, the second aspect I wanted to highlight is the fact that, uh, thanks to her, Syriac is now a subject represented in, in the French um, uh, Academy in one of the highest um, uh, scientific institutions in France. And so we can be really grateful to her uh, for her many contributions and also for who she is as a human being, uh, as a, an exceptional uh, colleague, but also uh, as an exceptional uh, woman. And that's how I will end this, uh, this few words. Of course, you can go to the page and if you want to have more details about uh, her, her many, many contributions. Thank you.
friends, um, at this point, I have the great pleasure and honor to introduce my former colleague and my current friend, Dr. Erin galgay Walsh. She serves as the assistant professor at the University of Chicago Divinity School, where she's also affiliated with the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and the Joyce Z and Jacob Greenberg Center of Jewish Studies. A graduate of Duke University and a former junior fellow in Byzantine studies at Dumbarton Oaks, Professor Walsh is a regular, vibrant contributor to, to a wide range of publications. Here, I would like to highlight merely her service as executive editor for the Ancient Jew Review, a journal devoted to the interdisciplinary study of Judaism in antiquity. Professor Walsh's scholarship engages the reception of biblical literature and the growth of asceticism within the Eastern Roman and Sassanid empires. Her particular focus rests on the unnamed women of the New Testament in Syriac and Greek poetry. To this end, she brings into conversation the works of Romanos, Nasai, and most importantly for our purposes, Jacob of Saruk. As you have already heard from Armando, today Professor Walsh will speak to us on the topic, Well-Versed in Pain, Biblical Narratives of Healing in Jacob of Saruk's Poetry. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Maria, for such a generous introduction. I would like to begin by first expressing my gratitude to the sponsor of this event, Bishop Zaidan, the organizers, Father Alcori and Dr. Kitchen, as well as the advisory board, Dr. Butts, Dr. Darling Young, and Dr. Blanchard. It is truly an honor to be included among such august company. I'm grateful for everyone for taking the time to attend via Zoom, and I look forward to your feedback as I prepare some of this material for publication. The imagery of medicine and healing appears throughout Syriac literature, from the Odes of Solomon to the Acts of Thomas and the demonstrations of Afrahad. As Robert Murray once observed in Symbols of Church and Kingdom, Ephraim favored the title physician, Asiyah, for Jesus. In Healing and the Theology of Ephraim, Aho Shimon Kasho showed how following the imagery, this imagery brings us to the heart of Ephraim's theological vision. Today, I will approach this topic by exploring one facet of medical language and imagery, namely suffering and pain. Pain in all its various forms, from the pesky paper cut to the agony of serious illness, serve as a reminder of the body's fragility. The body and mind intertwined and responsive to one another resist efforts to distinguish physical, mental, and emotional pain. Translating such sensations into language has challenged artists to overcome the apparent caesura between language and pain. Reflecting their immediate historical and cultural context, representations of suffering reveal the web of theological, philosophical, and medical beliefs informing the somatic imaginary. Narratives of martyrs and ascetics have proven fruitful sites for uncovering competing and intersecting discourses surrounding pain within late antique Christian literature. Jacob's poetry offers further underexplored resources for examining how Christians constructed the suffering self. Within Jacob's memre on the stories of Jesus's healing miracles, the physical, emotional, and social facets of pain cohere. In his portrayals of biblical characters, Jacob focused his audience's attention on the body in pain as pregnant with transformative potential. Medical imagery weaves throughout his poetry as a vehicle for reflection on Christology and soteriology. As time allows, I will treat the, th the themes surrounding pain and healing through examining his accounts of the woman with the bent spine from the Gospel of Luke, the hemorrhaging woman from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I will briefly touch upon the healing of the leper, also from Mark, Luke, and Matthew. Jacob's anti-Jewish polemic informs the depictions of Jewish authorities and legal reasoning found within these memre, evidence of the capacity of the poetic form to encompass a variety of rhetorical aims. As Jacob retold biblical stories, he interpreted them through accentuating multiple layers of meaning and hearing in this, within the scriptural text. 
The poetic narrator directs the audience's attention to the symbolic value of bodily pain, opening up the stories of biblical figures to address the universal condition of human sinfulness. Alongside this approach to biblical healing narratives, Jacob also deepens the characterization of characters through expanding descriptions of their ailments and attributing to them assertive, poignant speech. While silent or nearly so, according to the biblical accounts, these speaking poetic figures bear witness to their individual experiences of physical suffering and the social implications of their maladies. While one finds such symbolic readings of the body in Jacob's treatments, his attribution of imagined speech and elaborate biographical details to his protagonists resists the erasure of the individual beneath the weight of allegorical readings of their corporeal states. These moments of late antique pathography reveal how Jacob imagined pain through the scripted voices and textual bodies of biblical figures. So I turn first to the woman with a bent spine from Luke 13, 10 to 17. Among the episodes of Jesus's ministry recounted within the Gospel of Luke, the encounter of a nameless woman with Jesus is told in sparse yet intriguing detail. Nestled between the agricultural metaphors of the fig tree in 136 through 9 and the mustard seed in 1318 through 21, this narrative begins by underscoring the setting. Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath in the synagogue when he perceives the woman and addresses her with a message of healing. This passage belongs to a series of Sabbath healings. And as a result of the ensuing strife over Jesus's action on the Sabbath, commentators have observed that the narrative bridges the form of the miracle story and the controversy dialogue. For early and late antique Christians, biblical stories circulated in multiple ways beyond the lectionary readings, as Sebastian Brock has reminded us. Within the context of worship, poetry and liturgical texts were steeped in a biblical idiom. Extending over 389 verses, Jacob's Memra on this text meditates upon the details provided rapidly within the biblical narrative. Homily 169 follows Jacob's customary style as the narrator begins with an invocational prayer beseeching divine assistance in the preparation and offering of the Memra. Positioning the speaker in relationship to God as the addressee and ultimate source of his words, Jacob draws attention to the poet's dependence, quote, you speak in me and I will speak through you concerning you. As Susan Ashbrook Harvey has noted, the performance of the Memra conjures in an interactive exchange in which God, the poet and the audience, the audience and the ver and verbal expression are bound. Even in translation, the careful composition of Jacob's verses shine through. The oral qualities of the Syriac text enhanced through the repetition of vocabulary and specific sounds. For Jacob, form and content mutually reinforce one another as the poet slowly builds meaning and conceptual association. These opening verses prepare the audience to hear the rest of the Memra, modeling faithful receptivity through prayer. Jacob also clarifies the purpose of his divinely inspired speech designed to awaken or rouse the hearer to seek divine instruction. Upon this foundation, Jacob shifts this to the subject of his memra, the quote, stories of the sun, which constitute treasures for the discerning. Through a condensed rehearsal of the ministry of Jesus, the poetic narrator underscores the centrality of healing, reminding us that Jesus provided bandages for ulcers and relief for all afflicted, resurrection for the dead, and all joy for the sad. The good news of Jesus's message manifests in the intangible, in the tangible benefits of healing and succor for the suffering. Foreshadowing one of the pivotal disagreements surrounding the healing of the woman, Jacob adds that Jesus's remedies, or simply benefits, udrane, were available every day, just as his teaching was manifest every Sabbath. This couplet creates a parallel between the healings and his teaching while emphasizing their availability without temporal restriction. The remaining verses will unfold around these twin themes of the relief of pain and Sabbath observance. And as I continue, I'd like to highlight the wonderful translation uh, that I drew upon um, by Susan Harvey and Sebastian Brock and um, uh, other former students at Brown. 
um, I've made some changes to the wording just to emphasize the vocabulary of healing. Following the first 54 verses, which establish a frame and introduce thematic threads, the narrator ushers the woman, uh, ushers in the woman with a bent spine. He extends the biblical description of her bodily condition, quote, there was a woman, wretched and tormented, sick, weary, full of shaking, a lady of sufferings, Marat Rashe. This feeble woman who was bent over from illness, Korhana, for, uh, uh, for 18 years, had come and worshipped with great suffering. As we shall see in several passages, word choices form a key component of Jacob's artistry as they forge conceptual links. The second verse of this stanza turns to her physical condition with one of the most interesting additions. The woman is full of shaking. This term for shaking or stirring, zoe, appears in the Peshitta New Testament as a translation for earthquake, seismos, rather than a bodily tremor. One possible New Testament intertext may be uh, John 5, 4, the healing of a man who was sick for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. While the textual history of John 5, 4 remains contested, a handful of early Syriac manuscripts dating to the fifth and sixth century contain this verse, which translates the troubling of the waters as zo'at maye. Within this same passage, one sees a familiar vocabulary for illness. Um, and I'm also interested that Narsai, by comparison, uses the zoe for the emotions or the stirring. So it's, a, it's an interesting term that I'd like to pursue further. One familiar with the vocabulary of the Peshitta of Luke will also hear echoes in Jacob's word choices as he quotes 1311, that she was bent over from an illness rather than a spirit of illness, abbreviated perhaps for form. Within this description, Jacob introduces the theme of her religious devotion, as the last uh, verse said, for 18 years she had come and worshiped with great suffering, contributing to her emerging image as a model believer. The poet includes the duration of her illness, but adds that she had persisted in her religious devotion despite her suffering, hasha. She is both the lady of sufferings and the lady of pains. And here we see hashe and keba. Um, within these few verses. This vocabulary gleaned from the New Testament and abounding in earlier authors such as Ephraim provides Jacob a broad lexical palette. The constellation of terms blend to support the emerging discourse of suffering. Before we hear the woman speak, the narrator clarifies the significance of the woman's posture, gesturing towards Jesus' admonition that Satan himself has entrapped this woman in Luke 13, 16. Jacob inserts here a reference to Satan's role binding. By a sleight of hand, Jacob substitutes creation for the woman herself. And I quote, Satan had bound creation and bent and crippled her, that she would become a worshiper of rocks and trees and stars, before statues and painted images and idols. He, the lover of all falsehood, bent creation. Heathenis heathenism was a sickness in all the earth, and she was bent by it for a long time before false gods. The language used in Jacob's vivid account of the woman's condition in earlier voices echoes within these lines, strengthening the parallel between the woman and all creation. Under the dominion of Satan, creation ails from a prevalence of improper religious practice. Here we see Jacob instructing his listener to perceive and avoid pagan practice broadly construed. These exemplary verses point, uh, point uh, I point to are not isolated as Jacob breaks open the significance of the biblical figure that she is a type tupos in the verses that follow. Throughout the prologue and the expository verses, the narrator has established the interpretive scaffolding for drawing out the theological import of the biblical story. Shifting back to the dramatic action of the scene, Jacob turns his attention to the woman as she enters the, this poetic stage. Now more than halfway through the poem, Jacob imagines the woman, newly healed, disputing with the leader of the synagogue who was angered by Jesus's actions. With barbed invective, she chides him. Quote, she says to him, why are you so bitter? You hate someone and it does not please you that they are healed. 
If you see illness in someone, you do not have mercy. It is right today that you rejoice with us and not accuse me. If beloved, you are not made by the evil one who bound me, come glorify Jesus who freed me and exult with me. You are not a shepherd if you hate the healing of the flock, but a wolf who rejoices with injuries. The imagined dispute between the Jewish leader and the woman hinges on observing the Sabbath and the questionable propriety of Jesus's actions. While modern biblical scholars such as Elizabeth Schistler Fiorenza have remarked that the biblical narrative sidelines the woman once she is healed, Jacob extends the woman's role beyond the scriptural account. She plays an active part in the aftermath of her healing, justifying Jesus's actions as facilitating her participation on the Sabbath. Invoking the pol polar opposites of leadership, the shepherd, a title also used for Christ, and the wolf, Jacob offers a subtle commentary on ideal leadership, namely one that rejoices in healing and facilitates it. Addressing the Jewish leader once again, the woman divulges further biographical details about how her spinal condition impaired her previous practice. Quote, if it concerns you that I should guard the Sabbath or keep the Sabbath, as you say, the Sabbath was never kept by me except today. Rest on the Sabbath was not found by me until now. Why are you angry? Because I have rested according to the law. In every hour I was bound and bent and I was in pain and shattered and afflicted. Pain did not withdraw from my limbs on the Sabbath and it did not allow me to rest on the proclaimed day. The Sabbath did not give me rest from sickness and I was not at rest from exhaustion until today. Despite her silence and brief appearance within Luke's account, this poetic woman asserts herself, boldly challenging her interlocutor. In these verses, we witness the intersection of anti-Jewish polemic with the discourse of pain, as the woman disputes the suggestion that Jesus should delay her healing for another day. The woman both undermines the strict understanding of the law attributed to the leader and casts the law in a negative legalistic light. The binary between the liberation found in Jesus' healing and the legal reasoning of the interlocutor are stark. Performed within the environment of Christian liturgy, these verses reified boundaries between Christian identity and Jewish others, as Jacob magnified uh, conflicts present in Nuce within the New Testament text and expanded their scope. We shall see echoes of this confrontation in Jacob's depiction of the woman with an uncontrolled flow of blood and the healing of the leper. Now we'll shift to the hemorrhaging woman. Overviews of the reception history of this text have rarely considered Syriac literature beyond references to Ephraim. Employing a range of terms to describe the woman's ailment, Jacob offers his listener a fuller picture of the woman's medical history than the biblical narrative provides. While Jacob punctuates his account with a vocabulary of impurity, it is and purity, it is invoked selectively. Through his empathetic meditation on the woman's endurance of pain and social isolation, Jacob stresses the physical suffering of the woman. His narrative strategies combine to amplify the extraordinary character of this woman and her agency in seeking a cure. A brief reference to the opening verses is instructive. Jacob first reminds the listener of Jesus' previous actions, such as restoring a man's withered hand from Matthew 12, saving the Canaanite woman's daughter from Satan in Matthew 15, and forgiving the sins of the woman who wept. Against the backdrop of Je uh, Jesus' ministry, the narrator provides a description of her illness and efforts to find a cure. She wanted to bind up her great sore, shurna. The term the Peshitta translator uses is also found in Luke 16, 20 in reference to Lazarus's sores. The narrator adds that despite the persistence of this painful sore or ulcer, she was reluctant to reveal herself to doctors. The gender politics of the poem turn on the visibility invisibility of the sexed body. A series of verses relate how the illness became a chronic condition over the course of months and years, a relentless force crushing her. The woman's desire to preserve her privacy is slowly overcome as she grows more desperate. As soon as the pain grew stronger than herself, she was overwhelmed, and she started to tell to some individuals her secret 
Ratza, so that relief might may be found for her. She began with women and to her companions, she recounted her pain, and her friends with whom she shared her secret, Ratza, took care of her. And as the pain overwhelmed these wise women, she started to show her pain to the doctors in suffering. She gave herself both to exposure and to great expenses in the hope that even under shame and loss of, mon loss of money, she might be healed. In contrast to the terse account of her story in the Gospels, Jacob offers a logical progression of the woman's actions that amplifies her growing distress. Avoiding the language of blood, Jacob favors the generic term for pain to describe her ailment. The revelation and exposure of the woman's body, frequently referred to within these lines, advances the larger themes of the Memra, namely the, the disclosure of Christ's divinity through his healing of this woman. The woman's own body harbors a secret, ratza, a word which possesses a broad semantic range and is used as a term for sacrament, type, mystery, and symbol. Jacob maintains a sense of propriety with, within his imaginative reconstruction of the woman's strife. As she confides in her female companions, they attempt a, to cure her, an experience of community with which one can imagine the women in Jacob's audience identifying. Due to her bodily condition, this woman fears exposure and seeks concealment. As Jacob details the woman's experience, confiding in her female companions, and eventually doctors to no avail, she, he plays upon audience expectations surrounding the woman's behavior. The failure of doctors to effectively treat her illness compounds the physical suffering she experiences. Quote, she had enough of exposing herself to so many people, and she was weary of wasting uh, her money on all the surgeons and doctors. For a long time, the illness nested within her limbs as a serpent in a cavity hiding from snake charmers. Within his memra on the sinful woman, Jacob says that any sick person who approaches a doctor is without shame, seemingly contradicting the statements we have here. While one should not impose a forced coherence on Jacob's thought, these differing sentiments are suggestive. One might surmise that the intimate nature of this woman's illness uh, and the inability of her doctors to pr produce a cure results in this careful change. Jacob renders her illness as a foreign entity, an ominous serpent hiding within her body. This draws attention to her bodily condition, but it also shows a degree of discernment between health and illness, suggestive of an etiology of illness. Embellishing the biblical narrative, Jacob builds drama by depicting the woman's ailment as gradually increasing, growing more unbearable over the years. The flow of her blood tormented that lady of sufferings, and you'll recall the same phrase was in the woman who was bent over, more and more. For 12 years, she lived with the blood in a state of uncleanness. Echoing this, his description of the woman with a, with a bent spine, this lady of suffering withstands her bodily condition. Jacob introduces the root tama found here for her uncleanness and used at various points in the verses that follow. The frequency of Jacob's use of this root within this memra appears more pronounced when we read it alongside the narration of the woman who anoints Jesus, as well as the woman with the bent spine. So the vocabulary slightly shifts to be appropriate for these particular illnesses. And there's a lot of parallels between the woman with the hemorrhage, the, that vocabulary, and the leper. Those have more parallels. Um, through the voice of the narrator, Jacob describes the woman's condition with sympathy. In the first person imagined speech attributed to the woman, Jacob depicts the woman as addressing her own illness, willing in its expulsion from her body. Jacob builds dramatic tension through casting her affliction as a foe, rendering her ailment a threatening but silent presence, quote. And at the time she began in suffering to speak to her pain, ba. You stop and leave me, multiplier of my distress and my anxieties. You stop and leave me, evil sore, shuchna, which embitters my rest, and which, was, which has pierced me and torn me to pieces, weakened me, thrown me down, and increased my pains. You stop and leave me, cursed traveler, who has come to dwell with me, and who has destroyed everything I had, 
and still does not depart. You stop and leave me, O companion, who has yoked me to himself by a yoke of pain and who does not let me go, even though I hate him. Her strident words pulse with the urgency of the body in pain. Several of the verses in this litany are, uh, share a common, uh, common beginning, accentuating the rhythmic nature of her speech. As their momentum builds, the woman's words crescendo with anger and bravado, confronting the source of her suffering. Within the performative context of the liturgy, one must imagine the audience feeling the ebb and flow of these emotive lines. This is a woman coming to terms with her embodied state, which has driven her to the point of collapse. The hemorrhaging woman models an endurance of suffering that is far from meek acceptance of her plight. As the verses continue to unfold, the woman not only transgresses the purity statutes that would prohibit her from approaching Christ, but she disputes the applicability of the law to her condition. Attributing the laws that bind her actions to Moses, Jacob scripts the woman as engaging in an argument about the scope of the law. Quote, she says to herself, for me, illness has not observed the law, for just as the law which exists for, uh, which exists for nature, my illness should run in an orderly way. I do not affirm the law which pronounces me unclean, for behold, the purifier of the unclean passes by, I will cleave to him. Just as this illness surpasses the limit set for all women, so now I will surpass the limit set for all unclean women. Through verbal repetition, Jacob weaves together the woman's argument and presses the semantic range of his vocabulary. Well, the repeated invocation of the law, namosa, and limit or boundary, dogma, the poetic hemorrhaging woman meditates upon the forces which circumscribe her actions. So the social consequences of her bodily condition are in the forefront once again. As we saw earlier, the discourse of pain intersects with anti-Jewish polemic through the invocation of the law. In these remarkable verses, the poetic hemorrhaging woman challenges her status according to a constructed conception of the law she perceives as restricting her movements. While we previously explored her confrontation with her illness, here the woman challenges the scope of the law through suggesting that her own bodily condition exceeds the boundaries of nature. Jacob presents the woman as reasoning from her own bodily experience, her transcendence of the law emerges from the excess of her flesh. Inhabiting the voice of this biblical woman, Jacob projects ideals surrounding suffering and communal boundaries by rendering her body remarkable, distinct from the nature of other women whose bodies obey the law. Jacob may be circumscribing the applicability of her example so that other women cannot follow. I will touch briefly on the healing of the leper. Mamre 44 on the healing of the leper provides a helpful comparison to the two accounts featuring biblical women. The opening verses blend the language of healing with other imagery derived from biblical literature. Quote, he shone forth like the sun and illuminated the earth by his beauty and like shadows, illnesses fled from his rays. In comparison, the relatively short brief rehearsals of the miraculous healings found in the Mamre on the unnamed women, Jacob returns frequently to the restoration of sight for the blind, hearing for the deaf, and strength for the infirm within the opening verses. The moral lesson Jacob seeks to impart is the availability of Jesus' healing to all who seek him. One must never desist from reaching out. The vocabulary of pain merges with that of purity and cleansing, reflecting the nature of his illness. A noticeable emphasis is placed on the law and the figure of Moses, once again placed in a negative light. The social exclusion of the leper is attributed to the law. Through first person speech, the initially diminutive figure of the leper challenges the structure of, structures of the law that placed on him, uh, that, the, that the law has placed on him, while simultaneously affirming the power of Jesus to heal. Conclusion. In Jacob's hands, the embodied suffering and subsequent healing of these biblical characters perform in miniature what the world experiences as a result of sin. Alongside this cosmic scope, he composes a strident polemic against Martinet interpretations of biblical law. Jacob's artfully staged protagonist resists the erasure of the body, 
beneath the weight of allegorical readings of their corporeal states. At the beginning of this lecture, I alluded to the off-cited remark of Elaine Scarry that pain shatters language. This statement has always given me pause. In her Pulitzer Prize winning photography, The Undying, Anne Boyer calls this dictum into question, quote, that pain is incommunicable is a lie in the face of the near constant trans species and universal communicability of pain. So the question finally is not whether pain has a voice or appearance. The question is whether those people who insist that it does not are interested in what pain has to say and whose bodies are doing the talking. Within the writings of Jacob, the textual bodies and imagined voices of biblical characters plumbed the theological significance of pain, often in excruciating detail. Unfortunately for the historian, we do not have access to the responses of Jacob's audience. How did they react to these multidimensional, imaginative representations of biblical figures? Did he make the flesh and blood suffering selves within his audience feel seen? Or did his words remind them of their own, perhaps unanswered prayers for healing? Over the distance of so many centuries, Jacob's poetry offers us a poetics of giving voice to the body in pain, if we are willing to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for this wonderful lecture. It was wonderful. Um, to our audience, uh, to our participants, you may now ask your questions. I kindly ask you to raise your virtual hand. And if I may, I would like to start with a quick question. Um, could one interpret the suffering people uh, in Jacob's memory as types of suffering humanity, which Jesus heals? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that your reading with, from these uh, healing stories? I think one thing that I could emphasize more is also that the, the um, connection to sin as well. I think we have to keep that in, in you know, that it's humanity afflicted by sin. And I think that's an important thing to keep. Um, with what you're saying as well. Okay, so sin leads to uh, 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 sin leads to uh, uh, someone being to illness, but Jesus comes in and heals sinful humanity and restores it and gives it health. Is that what you're saying? I think yeah, that healing is is this great image for what is happening in the in the forgiveness of sins, and also you know I think they're both both valences are there. Okay, thank you. So open for questions. Okay, here you go. Oh, thank you, Susan. Uh, first, thank you so much, Aaron. This is just a rich, gorgeous presentation you've given and um, beautiful in its way of interacting with the Syriac of the artistry of Jacob's poetry and also for delving into the very powerful humanity of it and if i can just um draw a momentary or take you uh, a little bit further to um armando's question here it see i have long been struck in teaching uh, when i teach new testament by the contrast between the very concrete physical work of Jesus's ministry. He heals sick people. He gives food to hungry people. There are poor people. These are concrete uh, things that he does. And students often come uh, having been raised with ideas of religion where what they think Jesus is associated with are these ideas that are not concrete, abstract ideas, sin, um, you know, unrighteousness of any kind, moral conditions, ethical problems. I mean, it's as if it's as if it's hard to get the students to see that moral conditions and ethical problems really are about concrete things like bodies, you know, like war or sickness or poverty. You know, these these are bodily problems, but somehow there's a a disconnect where people, the students, are able to talk about those as abstract or real conditions in our world but they don't see in the biblical text this concrete almost ordinary world that jesus is acting in and what strikes me in what you're bringing out from jacob is that both of these levels 
mm -hmm. and more are at work in what Jacob's doing. So that um, when you talk about um, using a, a poetics of giving voice to the body in pain, I think Jacob is presenting these things in a way that anybody in his congregation is going to have some personal connection with what's being described because he renders these people at the same time that he renders them cosmic mm -hmm. and filled with revelatory grandeur. This is a person in pain. This is an illness. This is an illness which may not have a name. It might have a name. Maybe it doesn't have a name. If that isn't every individual on the planet who is, you know, or you or or your mother or your family member or your spouse or your child. So he he renders it at the microcosmic level in a way that bridges directly to people's bodies at the same time that he's presenting this larger cosmological universal battle between good and evil or however we're going to put it. But I, I think this is really this dance between cosmic collective uh, symbolism and an individual reality is a really important part of these these homilies. And you've really brought that out beautifully. And just um, if I can turn that long comment into a question, uh, listening to you on the woman who's hunched over and the way that her posture parallels earth or creation bent over in false worship. The posture there being described is of course a posture of prostrations that Christians also use in their worship. So it's interesting the way that Jacob is gonna take the exact same bodily gestures, postures that unfortunately, or unfortunately, that confusingly you know, characterize religion of this period, not just Christianity, and render it, you know, false in one context and true in another, because of course Jacob wants us, his listeners, to prostrate themselves in the right way and in the right context. So it's 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 just interesting that interplay. Anyway, I guess that was kind of just a response but thank you so much for this wonderful wonderful paper and you always give us so much to think about well thank you well thank you susan i mean i think um you know part of of the longer piece that i'm writing on the woman who's bent over is dealing with the new testament scholarship as well on this piece mm -hmm. and the reception history elsewhere um looking at greek and latin uh readings of it and one of the things that i wanted to bring out that i think um you know that jacob is doing here is, is that layering of through her voice and then the description. And I think that's something, um, you know, maybe I cut too much out, but I was thinking about the, as narrator, he's doing one overarching thing in the, as a preacher, and then she speaks. And sort of, I think that's holding it. Um, and I think it's, I mean, it operates in other, I mean, I was thinking about Simeon, uh, his name at all on, on Simeon the Stylite and talking to his foot. You know, it's a very, um, there's sort of a concreteness. And I understand what you're saying about, um, you know, I, I think within, I think how Syriac literature kind of resists uh, some of our assumptions about maybe creating things that are overly, you know, making sin overly uh, abstract of a concept is precisely this sort of uh, emphasis on, um, the body and the, the psychosomatic unity that's there. Um, Thank you, Susan. Anthony? Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Aaron, for really a very, I, I echo that, a very enriching talk this morning. And um, I'm wondering if maybe you would, would uh, comment, especially on the, on the story of Jesus um, curing the paralytic, mm -hmm. because that story is quite complex, and the idea between sin and um, restoration. Would you be willing to to talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, I, I do think that for all of these stories, and, and probably one of the the points of the Memra, um, it, the different memory is that they they don't separate the language of sin. That it, it's this idea of one of the things I'd like to think more about is is um, 
you know, for instance, in the woman with a bent spine, there's a presence of Satan. So there's a debate within modern con uh, commentaries about, um, you know, the possession, whether it's demonic possession and a healing, how does, how does it bridge those two categories? Um, whereas I think within all of these, Mamre, the, the idea of sin as, uh, you know, sort of manifesting in illness and the decreation that Jesus is here to kind of um, free and to, to correct and to heal, um, I think is linked and, and made tangible uh, there. And I think it's the same, um, you know, sort of approach to sin. I don't know whether I'm answering your question specifically. I'd have to think more. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I also would like to, to maybe just ref have you reflect a little bit about the idea further about sin being um, not so much passed on, but a cause of the parents, you know, and, um, you know, that idea that someone is, sin is a sinner because his parents were a sinner, et cetera, back there, and that sin is a consequence of, of evil. I, I think you spoke about that, but once again, I just want to say, I think that story is so complex, and uh, is Jesus curing or healing uh, something that was a punishment that was afflicted, inflicted on the paralytic. I'm not sure if my question is, uh, but I think you might get the drift on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think, I, I think it, it's sort of thinking about, um, you know, what, because partly, I mean, you do see the same language of sin comes up in Genesis and sort of the, the, the punishment. Um, but I don't know whether I, you know, I think for, uh, Jacob, I've, I've been more thinking about these sort of, I, I, in terms of lineages of sin. And I wonder whether we kind of, we're very precise about our ideas of agency and, and guilt. And I think mm. it's more of a, a, a condition, um, mm. that's being dealt with rather than, um, yeah, I don't know. That's how I would begin to think to have a more, um, response to that question. Yeah, thanks. That's helpful. Thank you, Anthony. Maria? Erin, thank you so much for this. This was both enormously scholarly and really beautiful and very, very deeply moving. Uh, I was put in mind of Christy Epson Sayers uh, remark that in late antiquity, just about everybody was sick just about all of the time and the ways in which that language would have very deeply resonated with an audience. I particularly appreciate your critique of Elaine Scary in this. I think this is a project that is fairly widely shared, but that I've rarely seen expressed as eloquently and as concisely as you have done here. One of the things that I'm curious about, because I see you gesturing to it throughout your paper, is um, the particularity of pain and particularly of women's pain. I'm hearing echoes in your paper of women's pain having particular dimensions that resonate additionally deeply and that communicate perhaps even more by virtue of the secrecy attached to it, by virtue of the shame, um, the, uh, uh, the marginalization involved therein. I wonder if I could get you to talk about this a little bit more. And if I'm totally mishearing you on that, please tell me that too. Um, I would say, that I do, and I think, you know, partly in my initial dissertation research, I think I've spent a lot of time with the unnamed women and often in, in seeing where the, the language of healing uh, is appearing there. I think the more time I spend with uh, the healing of the centurion's uh, servant and the leper, I'm given a bit of pause. Um, that I do think that gender is important. I think certainly the, the ways, I mean, I love the, the hemorrhaging woman and the choreography around her friendships, I think is, is quite lovely and sort of um, imaginative. But there's a way in which also the leper is afraid of the law and sort of excluded and does suffer socially as well. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, these are ideas, the, the biblical figures are becoming ideal believers. They're opened up for men and women alike to emulate. So I think there's a way in which gender operates in terms of the narrative details that Jacob expands. But I wonder if we over, I don't want to over determine um, the reading. Um, the other thing that I did, I, I sort of cut out from some of this is that 
I think a lot of these healing narratives have been, um, especially within New Testament scholarship, dealt with in terms of, uh, through the lens of disability studies, which tends to have uh, sort of point the finger at these hyper symbolic readings of the body as being problematic. And I, I think that, that Jacob offers us this sort of, as Susan was saying, this nice tension between the individual voice, the, the non erasure of the individual and holding together with these symbolic readings as well. Um, and I think that approaching these through this idea of pathography of writing about suffering might be a different way of sort of dealing and, and um, thinking about how late antique Christians were absorbing uh, these stories. Thank you, Maria. Other questions? If not, before we adjourn, I would like to remind you that our next speaker is Bishop-elect Roger Akras. He will deliver his paper entitled Merciless Apostles and Prophets, Criticism of the Righteous and Jacob of Saruk's Homily on Admonition on Wednesday, July 21st, 2021. Thank you again, Aaron, for your scholarly paper. And thank you, Maria and Muriel for joining us. And all of you who joined us on Zoom, on YouTube, or on Facebook. We will see you next time in July. Have a wonderful day.